Hello everybody, welcome to the show. I'm back here with Patrick Dixon to do some more spiritual science and I'm thinking I might have to change the title of this to Rudolf Steiner's Spiritual Science because I know some people were a bit confused as to what kind of spiritual science we were going to do. I think they thought we were going to talk about raising the dead and things, talking to the dead. Yeah. So, um, so I'm, I'm probably going to change the title to Rudolf Steiner's Spiritual Science because that's what we're here to discuss is Rudolf Steiner and Anthroposophy. So welcome to the show Patrick. Okay, yeah. I um, <laughs> thought we could start today, we were talking perhaps about the caduceus, the symbol that's the snake eating its own towel. Well, that's the Ouroboros. Right? Oh yeah, that is the Ouroboros. Yeah. Yes, but they're caduceus. all interrelated. I mean, the, the caduceus wand, you could say, also, there was that snake that Moses held up, and there is the caduceus, which is really two serpents, kind of, woven together, really they're up the spine. It's an, what that's an image of is the, there are actually three of what the Indians call the Nadis, the Ida, Pingala and the Sushumna. And Ida and Pingala are like these two weaving things that meander up the spine, up the cord you could say. And, and they're just as it, with a plait, with a braid, that doesn't hold together unless there is an in a middle, a third, which is what actually brings them together. This third central, the Sushumna Nadi, which weaves all the energy and binds it upwards into the brain, or where the self-realization, the third eye can open, and then the crown chakra. Because really what it's doing, it's taking earthly energy up into the cosmos and cosmic energy down into the earth. It's a conduit through this and in a sense it's connected with the chakras, it's the ladder of Jacob, it's many many things which also the rod of the runes that Jethro gave to Moses in a sense which when Moses went to Egypt after when he was about 80 years old after having been with Jethro for a long time. Jethro was a kind of initiate anyway and Moses had he married one of Jethro's daughters and then he he was called to go to Egypt after the burning bush which was really the I am before it was really fully incarnated in a human being. Moses task with many of the great figures of the Old Testament was to be to prepare the earth for that incarnation. <laughs> so he goes to Egypt and he has this wand which he can change into a serpent um, form of energy as a and he can externalize it and this and this was to counter the old egyptian magic that hermes trismegistus had originally started hermes was given the astral body of zarathustra after zarathustra left the physical world and Hermes Trismegistus was a great initiate that founded all the Egyptian mysteries of initiation, which at the time in the, in the main body of their civilization were absolutely valid preparations for future states of humanity. But there came a point where they started to be, they needed to be transcended, they needed to be go beyond because they were becoming kind of decadent. They were falling out of the main uh, purpose of the higher cosmic wisdom which was to realize something on the earth. <coughs> so Moses had to go and this was just around setting his people, letting his people go because of the slaves. The idea which is to let go of the slave mentality, that which was, you know, and to prepare each human being for the indwelling of the I am. That was what it was really all about. <laughs> so, he, and to do that he first of all had to overcome the Egyptian magic and he did that when you know the famous story they put their serpents on the ground and his serpent ate them consumed them you know what was symbolic of that was a <laughs> was a deeper higher wisdom that that was to take them in lift them up to another level but they it was more important so Moses takes this with the Ark of the Covenant which is also the synthesis of all that was the Jewish mysteries and the Egyptian mysteries which were being taken like a seed across the wilderness <coughs> and you know this the snake the 
one that Moses had, the Rod of the Runes, which is also connected with Odin, was actually the power, the potential power of the human being over the elementals of the earth through inner development. So, and all the miracles that he'd like, smiting the rock, water, all these things that happen were well, because of this. And then he goes up the mountain, gets the, the <coughs> tablets, but brings them and finds that the people have fallen away. They have lost their connection. They build the golden calf. That's another whole story. <coughs> but to go back to the Caduceus wand, the weaving together, which is slightly different from the one that the serpent's held up. That's called something else. I can't quite remember what it is. That's another. But that's all about the integration of the two by the one into the three becomes one. And this then ascends into the upper chakras, opens the third eye, and then opens the crown chakra, <coughs> which is also the preparation for the incarnation to come down into these vehicles. It's also connected with the mystery of the, the fallen serpent, you know, after the Garden of Eden, the serpent falls. And it, ha it represents the fallen astrality because it's the, anything that moves side to side is an image of the astral body. Like serpents, they meander. Like fish, they swim side to side. Whereas aquatic mammals undulate, which means that they're in a sense, they're rising up into another world, going back and up. They're going up and they're out of that world for a moment, which is a, a preparation for the ego consciousness in a way. So, and that whole thing about the serpent is that it falls down and it then becomes a vehicle of fallen astrality. And there's a strange connection between the venom of a snake and the ego, the power of the ego. It's like it's, a, it's what happens to the ego when it falls. It becomes toxic. <coughs> so the snake, and that's why, but also, you know, all these things can be turned to the good because the venom of snakes, spiders, and many other creatures can be used medicinally to reintegrate the human being, to bring it back into a cosmic connection because to expose these forces reminds the human being of the origins of their own incarnation. They're very complex details how these medicines would work, they would activate the caduceus serpents to rise up again, and that becomes the wisdom. It's, a, it's connected with the fallen wisdom of Lucifer, this incredibly wise being who falls away from the cosmic purpose and gives us all these capacities to think, but also egotism and competition and its wisdom without love. And that's and that has to be redeemed. And that wisdom without love is sim symbolized in the serpent power. So that's one aspect of the caduceus. Well, that's why he was the light bringer, wasn't he? He was the original light bringer, but he just brought the intellect, where Christ is the light bringer that brings well, the whole story, really, doesn't he? That's why he's the true light bringer. Yeah, I mean, he brought... The, yeah, Lucifer brought the illumination. He didn't bring the warmth, really. He didn't... That's what he, it was... Partly this ability to think, you know, in a way, this independence of thought, which was before, and linear thinking, which is preparation for thinking about the earth. I don't care about the cosmos. I'm, I'm going to master the earth. I'm going to think about that. We're going to relate. And then, of course, that also is connected with the division of the sexes in the Lemurian epoch, where desire and thought start crossing over the earth horizontally. There's no longer the crown chakra, the desire of the gods, for the gods, there's only desire for the fallen human being, you know, so because we become, we become blind, Lucifer's light, to a certain extent, blinds us to the divine light, the true divine light. <coughs> but it's, it's all gone. Well, I was going to say also with the, uh, the snake symbol, sometimes it can be seen taken as a wise snake, or there's the sly snake, so it yeah. can be of either ways, can't it? Oh yeah, yeah, no, there's great there's a great deal in the snake symbolism. Even in the snakes that are existing in the world now, it's physical form. I mean you have the constrictors and the the ones that inject venom and they do it different ways and it's very and the what the effects of that's on us. I mean the in a way you could say the great Midgard snake <coughs> from the Norse myths mm -hmm. is one that really in some senses 
both envenomates the astral body of the human being, which cuts it off from the cosmos, but also constricts. He, it's almost he winds around the earth like a giant boar constrictor, constricting us, pressuring us in a way which, you know, we, we're then forced to bow down or to serve that force. It's like suffocating us. That's really, and that's of course counter to the um, Fenris wolf, which does something else. Um, I mean, the, the serpent is really an image of unrestrained astrality in some ways, you know, but it also works from a very hidden sense. It's something that has lodged itself in the human astral body. Like all these great archetypes from mythology are in our astral body. And what, what's really being asked is that the incarnation, the divine cosmic principle, the Christ, which was there before all of them, all the other elements will gradually bring into order, gradually transform, gradually draw them into the service again of the divine purpose. But if that being is denied, if that higher divine, true divine being is denied, then disorder will eventually overtake every, every, nothing will be able to develop itself towards true integration. And that's, that's the great warning. I also find it interesting that I'm pretty sure the Midgard snake was originally, before it tried to go around the world, or did go around the world, it was underneath the tree of, yeah. and then we've got the tree in there, the tree of Eden, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, so there's yeah. tree and snake oh, yeah, connections yeah, going yeah, on yeah, here. Yeah. Well, the tree, of course, is a vast archetypal image, the Yggdrasil tree of Morsemith, the Garden of Eden tree of life, tree of knowledge, the tree that the Buddha sat beneath, the Bodhi tree, and you know, also symbolic of the you know, that we are, in a way, in our bodies, we are under this tree, and we go down into this body, this tree of veins and nerves, and, you know, which think the breathing lungs, all this is a tree, both <coughs> both an ocean, I mean, in the sense, of after Atlantis, it's a, we, you know, the air and the water separated in a way that they'd never been before. Water crashed down into a level of density 800 times greater than air, and at the same time, inwardly, the human being became drowned, in a sense, in their own bodies, because we are largely water, and we're saved from that. The brain literally floats, and of course the arc image is true of that too. Though these things happened also on a physical plane, there are also other levels in which they are showing other realities. So all those things are connected. I also think it's quite interesting, like when I was a child, there was a game, and I'm sure you've played it and others had the snakes and ladders game, and you mentioned oh, Jacob's yeah. ladder, and, you know, you always went down the snake yeah, and that, yeah, the ladder yeah, in yeah, that. Yeah. That, of course, is more. interesting, because in a way, I always said that um, <coughs> snakes are like habits, and ladders are like routines. <laughs> you have to climb a routine. It takes a bit of effort. And it's a uh, habit you literally slide down into. It's, it's, yeah. And that's, <coughs> and then at the end you get bitten. <laughs> you kind of, you know. But um, yeah, it's, it's a sort of image. We are always kind of oscillating between snakes and ladders in our own being. You know, we've kind of. <coughs> mm -hmm. But we can more and more and more bring the ladder principle into our being. You know, we can even eventually climb up the snake. You know, that will be the ability to do that. But. Well, they talk about that in ancient Egypt, actually. It's about, um, you, you should be able to, there's all these images of the, the person as they're going through all their little uh, initiations, I suppose they are, but at the end, it's the person riding the serpent. Yeah, 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 of course, that is. I mean, that's where it is. you master it over that force. I mean, the, you know, you have the putting the serpent under your feet, you know. That's all this stuff about the high ego mastering the, meanderings of the astral body, you know, the <coughs> endless distracting forces. Yeah. And that's what the Sushumna Nadi in the center is doing. It's pulling up, it's tightening the braid, the, the plait, you could say, of these forces on either side into a single purpose. It's not allowing them to pull you apart, you know. And that's what the great statue, the representative of humanity is about, also the central figure is drawing these other beings into the higher purpose, where they're constantly trying to pull it in different directions, you know, so, <coughs> and that is the sort of astral body. <coughs> the purification of the astral body is this whole thing about the spirit self, 
when you've got that purified, we were doing it in the study group, that you eventually, you, this astral body serves the higher ego rather than enslaving one. You know, that's the danger that if Luciferic and Aromatic forces, well, Luciferic forces take over the astral body and then Araman gets into the ether body and then you can become a real slave. Your ego's not working. It's either not there or it's being, you know, paralyzed. And that's, that's one of the great aims of those forces. They won't succeed. And uh, as we were saying before, they are, in a sense, these dark opposing forces are being drawn out of the earth by the more, more and more spiritualized ego powers, both of the incarnated human beings and those coming in are also bringing forces from the higher worlds down into the physical world, which are, in a way, drawing out from their hiding places those forces that oppose. So. Well, I was also thinking then, as you were saying about that, about the Kundalini's often represented mm. as a snake. Mm. I know Steiner doesn't go too often into the Kundalini, does he, as far as from what I've read. But I know where I've done um, Egyptian esoteric works, they see it as the Kundalini, if it's waking up, that's when it's coming out through your third eye, which is why the pharaohs are depicted with the serpent and the eagle mm, um, mm. At the, on their foreheads coming through the third eye, because it's the coming together of... Well, the eagle would be the air, wouldn't it? And the serpent would be, I would assume, the overcoming of the earth forces. Have you got anything to say on that? Yeah, well, of course, that's also not unrelated to the scorpion and the eagle in the zodiac. You know, what the <coughs> Kundalini does, it's this coiled wisdom that has been put into the deeper part of the human being, the sleeping will, you know, when the individual no longer has a personal will connected to the cosmos. In fact, it's never happened. It's, it's a new thing that we will put our will consciously in service of the higher will of the gods. I mean, to know that, I mean, we all get to work. I get up every day, we work, we force ourselves to do things we don't want. That's our will. But it's not... It's not yet, the whole society is not yet geared that that personal will can also be part of the greater cosmic, fully conscious purpose. And in a way, Kundalini is, is when that awakens, that is what happens, is that the conscious, the universal will, the cosmic will, surges up inside the chakras and raises, rises up and becomes, you know, this awakened brow chakra and then crown chakra. But of course, mm -hmm. it has its dangers. If you awaken that stuff without the right preparation, it can drive people into forms of insanity, especially in our age with materialism, because you're, you're activating an extremely powerful force which overwhelms what we call our personality, our normal day-to-day -day ego consciousness. <laughs> so it has to be, the ego consciousness has to be prepared, it has to have the knowledge that this ego consciousness is the seed which eventually will grow into higher faculties which will serve the whole purpose of evolution. If you awaken Kundalini without that, and that's, that can be quite dangerous. You know, it's like having an enormous power but not knowing what to do with it. You know, you're out of control. It's like a child in a power station or with nuclear bombs. You know, you're not really... Yeah. You haven't, you've got to have the moral development to be able to channel it in the right way. So, I mean, there are people warn about wakening up prematurely, but it does happen, you know, probably from initiations that went wrong in previous lives, you know. Oh, because I, I, I was about to say to you, I've, I've noticed in the last few years a lot of people have been waking up prematurely, but so you think it might be because of initiations yeah, 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 wrong yeah, in previous yeah, yeah. lives? Probably incomplete, or what, they're incomplete, they weren't completed properly, they went wrong. <laughs> You know, so they've got to experience them again, you know, um, and that's, and a lot of initiations in different societies and civilizations will have a different quality. I mean, even the mummification of bodies, souls whose bodies were mummified, that will have an effect on the after-death state, I and mean, even the future mm -hmm. life, you know, so <coughs> these things carry over from previous lifetimes. And initiations were about essentially about awakening the human being to what they really are and what their purpose is in, within the universe. And 
if that's only half developed, and also if it comes, you know, it may be a fully developed initiation, but can come into this present time, and it can't deal with the overarching ubiquity of aromatic forces that are everywhere around us. You know, so you, mm. you have a very strong soul development, and you come into an educational system which has no con concept of the soul, and in its worst sense completely denies its validity, which is certainly happening in some places, you know, so... So it makes people <coughs> feel very strong, because there's, you know, no, no initiator to help them, mm. no gurus to help them along, or they go looking for gurus who might lead them down the wrong path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, I see a lot of people are looking for help, because they're having all these experiences and they don't know what to do with it. Yeah, they're without a compass. I mean, we're, not, we're in an age that teaches materialism and denies anything else, in a sense, a lot of it. And, uh, and therefore there's no... What lives within human beings when they come, even people who become materialists, they come down with the soul that's active. And there's, there's nothing feeding it, guiding it, nourishing it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's, it goes what's already around them and it conforms to the, you know, the particular form of idea, materialism, that's all around them. And that takes them even further away. But they can't reconcile this inner thing which they bring with them with what they're going to meet. And I think also things like cop death are often a lot to do with that. They can be, a soul can, be, can feel it and suddenly withdraw because it senses something so alien to its own being, you know, that it can't, it just hasn't got the forces to incarnate or deal with it. And in all these things like anorexia and bulimia, I think anorexia is, is like when, when a, mostly women, young women, don't want to get their body to the point where they can reproduce. Mm -hmm. So what they're, what they're doing is they, they want to get their body to the weight it was as a child, you know. So it's, so <coughs> and it's a fear. They're yeah, staying in that state, which is a kind of innocent state, because they fear those fallen forces that the double are connected with, you know, when you have physical relationships, you know, you know the whole thing and the whole incarnating of a child, all that stuff. They want to go back to an earlier state of being. Perhaps even that before the division of the sexes, you know, so all these things about moving yourself away from the present experience of the world because it's too difficult to deal with, which is very understandable. Yes, definitely in these uh, very strange times, or as they say in the Chinese uh, things, it may you live in interesting times, we are definitely living in interesting times. Oh, yeah. And Steiner was saying that it was going to be up to, well, 100 years after he was giving these lectures, he was set, he was that would be the time when humanity would be on another pivot point, and it feels like we are. Oh yeah, definitely. We're, I mean, we're definitely at a time where a choice is going to gradually form itself within the human being, which is, you know, do you absolutely believe what modern science is saying about the universe, or, or not? Do you think there's more? I mean, I was interesting, I was listening to Brian Cox the other day, who was on this program on Radio 3 called... Um, Private Passions. Mm. It's quite interesting because actually he has very, very good taste in music. I mean, he's, you know, he's really the soul. You can see there's a soul there, but, you know, the spirit is, you know, his, his discipline denies the spirit. It is a long process of gradually saying, well, there's nothing there. We now know that this is what it is. These are stars there, that, and these planets. And then he brought forth the whole thing about the Fermi paradox. You know, which is, why hasn't, if there are, there must be other civilized, why haven't we been contacted, why haven't we, of course this should, this is, a, that thought is a product of materialism, because it doesn't understand that actually the universe is thronging with being, and actually, everywhere, I always say this, everywhere we, where we cannot go in our bodies, as we are, is spiritual. You know, whatever, even if people go to the moon, they're not going to the moon really, they're going wrapped up in earthly and sub-material substances taken from the earth. So that's very indicative, even the bottom of the ocean, you can't, you can go to these places spiritually, and actually we will go to these places. We have to develop, you know, out-of-the-body experiences where we will begin the transformation, not only of the spheres, but also the planets themselves and the, of the ocean through the development of imagination, inspiration, intuition, and beyond. You know, that's the real thing. And there was this man who's, you feel is a good soul, but he's, he's, he's indoctrinated into this, and that has to be 
challenged, you know. I agree with you on that, because when he first came out doing all these science programmes on BBC, see, I knew him from the 1980s, I didn't know him personally, yeah. but um, in the 90, late 80s, 1990s, mm. he was in a very famous pop band, yeah, which yeah. I can't I think it might be <coughs> D-Ring or something. Yeah. So you feel like, oh, this guy's one of us, because mm. he, he did all this wonderful music. Yeah. But when I started watching his shows and realising, oh, he's not putting the spirit into it. He's, he doesn't believe in a God. He works for CERN. He does stuff at yeah, CERN. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, of course, that is a huge... I mean, CERN, to me, CERN. You've got CERN, you've got MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Caltech, uh, NASA. They're all really, to a certain extent, hugely permeated aromatic centres which, which further this world picture. They confirm it and consolidate it. And I think, in a way, with someone like him, a lot of people, it's a kind of possession. It's kind of taken over. It's very, very powerful. Um, and CERN, particularly, this idea that, you know, eventually they want to build a thing around the whole Earth. You know, that would be a sort of image of encircling, the binding the Earth into Araman's purpose. So it's like a hunter and collider around the Yeah, that, I mean, yeah. I, whether that's actually happens, you can imagine that's archetypally yeah. what Araman would like to do. And, and that also related to the fact is that you're circling the Earth with all these satellites, you know, which are, you know, like a sort of counter-mechanistic image of the ancient circling of beings around the formation of planets. And even, it's interesting, even the materialistic astronomers are annoyed with that because they can't make their observations so well, you know. So, But all that stuff that he's been involved with, like quantum mechanics and all that thing, is brilliant in a certain sense, but it's a brilliance that is, it dislocates you from a greater form of cosmic intelligence, which will further your development and development of the whole Earth. I mean, I mean, Simon lent me a book on quantum mechanics. It's actually, to someone like me, it's completely unreadable, partly because it's, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by mathematism, proportion, relationships, you know, between, I do a lot of geometry and all that sort of stuff. But that kind of algebra that they use is just, it's kind of repellent, really. And, you know, it's like it's its not, you kind of say, OK, can you say that? What you're doing in that equation, can you put it into words? What does it mean? And they can't. No, because nobody understands what no, quantum no, physics no, is. No. It's only a theory. They, they, may, they <laughs> may, you see, what they're doing is they're actually creating a world, a consistent world, separate from nature. That's what they're creating. That's why CERN is underneath the Earth. It's, and they don't know, they don't know they're doing, they don't know they're serving, really most of them don't know they're serving a being as counter to humanity. That's a schizoid thing. But it's, and that, that world would be the eighth sphere, which souls, and that would be related to the same world that someone like Elon Musk would say, you can upload your consciousness onto a computer. That's your immortality. People are saying that's your immortality. And then you've got transhumanism, and you make the body implant. All that stuff is a sort of caricature of the real immortality, which is a profoundly super-organic process that takes place over great amounts of time and cycles. And this stuff, given immediately, is, is the thing that will eclipse that. And so, you know, that's, and that's why I see people like him. I mean, we, we need to try and reach out to them to say, look, you know, there is more, you know, this this stuff is... I agree you, with you on that. I try to send them the thoughts of awaken to your conscience. Yeah. And then maybe you'll be understand where you're you're coming at it from, you know, a, an unbalanced side. It's very difficult for them to see that. I mean, because they're so immersed in that kind of technology. It's kind of, you know, it's they've been so implanted with those ideas that to to make them look again in another way... But it's, it's something it's, it's worth trying to do. I mean, one of the ways I've, I've said it before is we, you know, the more you, and Elizabeth Brader, who's an astronomer who was connected with Steiner, you know, as you go into the universe, you're not going to physical space. You're going into more and more moral space. The higher, the longer you go into higher worlds, the morality. And then you say, what does that mean? It means that their greater purpose for the good, for for infinite expanses of time. You know, you can be good for half an hour, you can be good for a lifetime, but these beings are good for eons. They're committed to eternal goodness. You know, and that's... And she talks about spatial, this idea I've seen in films, you know, where you're supposed to be travelling through the stars and stars are going past. Is That's completely unreal. 
they're not really in that depth three-dimensional sense and to us they're completely it's completely other you know it's that's that's the kind of picture that has to be changed you know what and as I say we are the real astronauts when we die we go through we travel through these dimensions you know um, but these dimensions are not the kind of dimensions that scientists are talking about. No. Like they talk about, oh, the fourth dimension, that's yeah, time. Yeah. These are dimensions that are beyond our... Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's moment. a very, the very nebulous, interesting way of putting it, nebulous word. I mean, dimension. I mean, they talk about 11 dimensions. I mean, you know, they give examples like, for instance, this pipe, and there's an ant crawling over it. You know, and it's, it's one dimension, then there's another one inside. You know, I mean, there are many, yeah. but the, the what... Anthroposophy and things like that are talking about are states of being, like the, of consciousness. You go into different states. You know, you can be in the same space but in a different state. And in one way, you could actually say there aren't any real places. There are only states of consciousness. Even this room is really something has become a state. It's a state of consciousness. There are books and all around, and, and all the artifacts are. An, because all these things will disappear eventually. All this physicality will disappear. Of course, what mainstream science says, it clings on to the idea that we've got electrons, positrons, protons, and that's the everlasting reality. It's not at all the everlasting reality. It's an aromatic insertion into our sense of what reality is. And it's, it's, it's the actually the most transient of all. I mean, you know, the idea... Is, from the sort of anthroposophical one, you talk about the great conditions of consciousness are the Earth, you know, Jupiter, Venus, those. Then out of those come seven conditions of life, the three elementals in the mineral, plant, animal, human. And out of each one of those conditions of life come seven conditions of form, divakan, high divakan, lower divakan, physical, perfected astral, divakan again. And, and then out of each one of those conditions of form comes seven planetary epochs, and out of each of those comes seven culture ages. But what the emphasis is, that consciousness is the primary. Life comes next, then comes form. You know, whereas and that, it, materialism does the opposite way around. It's like form, matter, is there first, and then life and consciousness arise, and they're all transient, but the physicality isn't. And one has to get really clear about that. And that, in a sense... You could say that a lot of these scientists could go through a Damascus experience where the whole thing is turned upside down, mm. you know, in their consciousness. Which you just have to have with St. Paul, you know, in one moment he's going direct attack the Christians, the next moment he's the greatest champion of Christianity. But with the, just going back to the, how they want to upload our consciousness into the computers and things so that we live forever, mm. that's not going to be us though, is it? I don't think... They can move our consciousness out of ourselves. We don't actually know where consciousness is. This is going to be like a, a digital version of ourselves. It's just made up of information. It's yeah, not yeah, actually yes, us, Yes, well, of it? course. That's also the great delusion. That people think, I'm uploading my consciousness. But you're not going to be conscious of it. Mm. You're just creating a kind of electronic sort of thing. In fact, what you might feel is you might feel a terrible emptiness and you're actually being, you've been robbed of something. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, almost like the suicide idea that you're, you commit suicide and then you need to get back into a body. You can't, you know, you've lost it. You've lost it. This thing, all you're aware of is this terrible sense of loss, you know. And that could be what happened is Ariman's stolen all the principles of your being and left you in an empty place, you know, where the only thing, you're paradoxically full of emptiness. So, yeah, it's, it's, well, I mean, this whole thing about electricity is such an important thing to understand. Maybe you could explain what Steiner says electricity is, because not many people um, understand that from the Rudolf Steiner point of view. Yeah, it's, also, it's a very, very difficult thing to grasp, because on one level you could say initially there was this light, that, and then there was Luciferic light, there was wisdom that flowed around the Earth. Originally it was the great cosmic wisdom. As it contracted those beings withdrew and they were taken over by other beings who it was then circling and binding the earth into a form, its major contractile form. Then it was taken by the aromatic forces down into the earth and every time you incarnate you, it enters you as well. 
So I always say the shadow, when you bring something down from the vertical to a surface, a shadow comes along the horizontal to meet it. So when you put your foot down, your shadow attaches to your foot. And that's an image of the way the double attaches to your body when you incarnate. And the fact is that it's horizontal is also very symbolic, you know, of the serpent again, the fallen image. So, <coughs> but electricity is also, you know, in a way, it's almost synonymous with what I call earthbound thinking. Horizontalized thinking. What I mean by that is thinking that is not, has no interest in the cosmos, no understanding of cosmic intelligence or anything, and therefore it's all earthbound. And that becomes, you could say, the intellectual activity of the past becomes the electricity of the present, you know. So it's, it's, we're making electricity through that purpose, whereas the, the next level is the transformation and redemption of electricity, lifting it out and changing it into a, what I call a world-encircling thought organism, which is also the new clairvoyance and all those things that will come, and magnetism, the world-encompassing feeling entity. Those things will happen when we realize that what is, we see as external forces have actually got something to do with our inner development. That's just as the, all these cosmic principles that astronomers talk about are also reverberations of what human consciousness is doing on the earth. And just as you know, we say, Steiner says, when you excarnate, you're, you gradually become a universal being. You expand in all kinds of ways. So you, and therefore you could say, I said it before, the scientists are often looking at the effects of their own consciousness, rather than what they think, they're just looking at externally objective physicality. So it's, it's a complete change, it's paradigm. I mean, listening to Brian Cox saying, oh yeah, we're getting these new ideas, we're discovering it. But what, what the real change is so much vaster, and it's literally turning the whole thing inside out. You know, what we are, that we're not just here, we're also out there, and what's out there is shining in us, you know, rather than there's just that there and there's here and there's, they're totally separate. So how would we use electricity today, from a, again, from a Rudolf Steiner point of view? What should we be doing with electricity? Well, I think, we, I, I, I think all these alternative ways of generating it are obviously a, a stepping stone. I mean, they're also questionable, like solar panelling. And, well, they create your demonic entities, don't yeah, they? Yeah, the wind, yes. I mean, that's a, that's a problem in a way. But because you're also working, it's slightly different from the things like CERN, because in CERN you're burying and you're not relating at all to nature. So what you're doing in those realms is you're creating, you may not be fully aware of it, something that is a complete alternative to what we call nature. Whereas when you're having windmills and you know solar, you're actually you're working with nature. You may be downgrading it into electrical forces, but you're not actually creating an alternative reality. I mean, I think, you know, I think what we, if, if we work with things like flow forms and we un and gradually understand that if we do it in the right way, working with different shapes and forms and rhythms, we will start to work with the ele elemental beings will start answering us and this will begin to power devices. That we, we have to ask ourselves, what, what, do, we, what do we need power for? M initially, we needed it for warmth, and light, and it gets more sophisticated, like you cook, you, you then refrigerate, all these things that we actually need. For. And then, of course, there are all this thing where you work with materials, you have to, you know, heat things up to mould them, to you know, make them molten, to do all those things. You've got to question that, what, what's really going on. And, of course, the great thing will happen is, because all these things are about what we've taken from the earth is underneath. We're dealing, even when we make molten metal, we're dealing with things that are really images of what goes on inside the earth, the volcanic processes. What we've more and more got to do is to realize that we're, forces are coming down and working with those forces that are coming down rather than digging up and tearing up. The forces that are coming down to us, which is, you know, it seems in things like eugenic occultism, the right way, mechanical occultism, musical occultism. What plants do all the time is they're alchemically taking cosmic forces and bringing them into earthly form, and also taking earthly form and bringing them back to the cosmos. So what goes on in a plant will be an image of, a, of what I, much of what we call technosophy, and things like flow forms, where you're 
working with water more as a living entity rather than we've got to get away from this thing principle that we're just dealing with things this is where someone like Ari you know talks about the all beingness that is behind the elemental beingness behind all external form and deadness you know and it's us it's us to us to free the world from that deadness to resurrect it you know so that's Harry Forreston <coughs> you're talking about there yeah. because I've actually um, been on a few courses with him in Emerson and we were looking at the flow forms there and then he was saying that some of them weren't working properly and suddenly we begin to notice they weren't but then we had to concentrate on whatever the entity was that was interrupting that flow form and Christianize it. Because the whole point of the uh, flow forms is to keep a continuous, like you were saying, a continuous current of, because they're water, aren't they? But maybe you could go a bit more into what flow forms actually are for those that don't know what they are. I've never heard of them. Well, of course, they're mostly made of sort of ceramics or concrete. And they're really what they are is a stepwise forms which to a certain extent imitate the spinal column the way if you go down from the cervical vertebrae from the neck and down into the thoracic vertebrae you see though the archetypal you can see how they gradually change you can see how they each so if you take one from the lower part and put it in the wrong place you know it's not that's not the place it's got to be they've got to be an exact place to show the gradual transition of form which is it's coming down into the sacrum from the skull you know and that this is and this is also connected with the caduceus because in a way that's what the water should do it's got to describe this kind of caduceus um, principle and it which it, which reactivates its cosmic connection connects the earth water with the cosmic water you know which is <laughs> yeah I mean it's, it's one of those things that's at the very beginning of its development and other ways, I mean, just working with materials in a more inspired way, like the, the planetary metals. If you arrange the planetary metals in a positions to each other, you take as a proportional weight of a planet or size of a planet, and you put another one over there, proportional weight of the particular metal, you're already setting up a relationship of forces, which in the aromatic technology is seen more in things like the voltaic cell, which originally put layers, different metals, you know, and that would be should generate. But this would be a much more cosmic thing. And eventually you could, if you moved it, you, you'd establish relationships. And then you put it in connection with the cosmos itself, with the actual macro movements of the cosmos. And you're, bring, you're, you're bringing down cosmic wisdom, which can become earthly form and earthly substance. And then you can take substance up into, you know, superstance. So the the relationship, the interrelationship between the cosmos and the earth will be established in a way it's never been done before, rhythmically, as opposed to hurling forces, from, you know what I mean? Yes, yeah, it's like, cause we, we, we've got the evolution coming from the cosmos to help us mm. and the planet, and we should be working with that so that then we can send it back out in an evolutionary way. Yeah. But of course most of the world isn't doing that. At the moment, no, because we're under, we are under this incredible sort of imminent, ubiquitous, aromatic force, which is, which is part of our evolution. And this is, as I say, we're exorcising aromatic. The world collective higher ego power of the human being, the I am working through many souls, both coming in and going out, and all, all stages of the great journey are actually drawing aromatic into manifestation so that he can be taken on and transformed. Whereas, you know, he thinks he's coming up to mutate us. He's actually coming up to be transformed by us. You know. Yeah, he, he needs our help to... Well, I think that's what Steiner says, doesn't he? That we, we're supposed to um, find the secrets of the dark forces to help them in their transformation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we redeem them. We've got to redeem them. That's the Christ principle. In the human being has to redeem Ariman. It's something that he doesn't want. But that's something that... He will want. When it's happened, then he will say, wow, yeah, I didn't realise that. That's pretty good. <laughs> no, but it's going to take a long time before that happens. Yeah, um, it's not going to happen tomorrow, is it? But no, we can no. help with tomorrow oh, yeah, by yeah, doing this yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. And that's why we have to get more and more aware of the long-term purposes that can awaken in us. You know, when we can really see, then we can endure 
a tremendous amount because we can see the greater possibilities. If it's only short term, you think, oh, well, you know, what, what the hell should I, you know? Well, but why am I taking part? Yeah, I've got yeah, my yeah, own yeah, stuff yeah, to do, yeah. but it's a long term, yeah, yeah. hugely yeah. long term project. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we were talking about the snakes at the beginning, and I wanted to just bring us back to snakes at the moment because in the um, I'm sure it's in the New Testament. It talks about how the snake is, we have to tread upon it. And I think he says it's Mary that does it. Mm. The divine yeah, feminine, yeah, is yeah, that? Yeah, Could you perhaps yeah. go into that a bit? Yeah, from the yeah. Well, of course, that in some senses is the sort of what I call the higher intuitive consciousness, treading on the slithering intellect, you know, the toxic, you know, all that sort of stuff that is associated with the serpentine intellectual forces which are have to be put into the service of the higher being. I, I, you know, I just think that's... And in a way, the snake on the physical level has taken away the extreme aspects of the astral body from the human being. That's, that's the great sacrifice of the animals. They've externalized something that, you know, otherwise would have been in us more powerfully than we could possibly deal with. So... So we're all working upon the snake within ourselves. At the same time, we're having to fight the snake that's trying to take us out. But at the same time, there's also this wise kind of snake to give us oh, the wisdom. Yeah. Be <laughs> as wise as serpents, gentle as doves, you know, as a statement. It's a wisdom. That is, if you have the dove, you can put the serpent to your service. You know, it's by, it's that... <coughs> I mean, they are, they've, they've been more cultures, and they are extraordinary creatures. I mean, I used to, when I was very young, I used to collect reptiles, you know, because I, I was very interested in snakes and things like that, because, and they, they have an extraordinary effect on other animals. I remember a grass snake I had, and it went up to this pig pen, and it just drove those pigs crazy. You know, they, they animals respond, they feel mm. something. From they, them. Can, yeah. they can sense it sort of clairvoyantly in a primal way, you know, what that force is. But it is a force that has to be lifted up. It is a low power that is also potentially a very high one. That's the whole mystery. When you can lift... Because originally the serpent didn't slither along the ground. No, it he had was, legs. Well, it was just... <laughs> it was able to elevate. I mean, Milton talks about it in Paradise Lost. You know, this incredible creature. But it then fell. You know, and that was its... And that's an image of us. Our chakras fall into service of the earthly desires instead of... <coughs> Right, okay, because if, if, um, I thought in the, maybe it's one of the Gnostic Gospels, they talk about that was the punishment of the snake for making Eve take from the tree. They took off his legs and that he had to then sliver on the ground for the yeah, rest well, that, of eternity. Yeah, that is a good way of looking at it. I mean, I, I'm writing a thing where I talk about that. You know, what he brings about the fall. You know, they, <coughs> so they fall in love. They fall to the ground. He falls yeah. on top of her. You know, it's a fall. Everything's falling <laughs> because of this. And the serpent then winds itself around the earth and constricts breathing and contracts everything. You know what I mean? So it's a. But they are amazing creatures in a way. I mean, if, if purely as structure, what the wisdom in the snake is, you've got this complete fusion of the digestive system with the backbone. So you've got this. Everything is contained in this form. You know, we have a sort of, you know, it's both its peristalsis and its normal movements are the one, the same thing. You know, we have this sort of, so it's got all these different things going on inside it. You know, and this, and the way they move are very, some they move very amazingly, some very different. I mean, there are all kinds of, you know, they're the, the most toxic and there are and snakes that, most of the snakes are not actually poisonous. Most of them. No. But, but them. most of them are in Australia are very dangerous. Yeah, you've got, Australia's <laughs> got the most poisonous thing, the Taipan. <laughs> But you don't often get come across it. You, it's not one that goes among the most civilized. In Africa, they have the most problem because they have the black mamba and the green mamba. They often go into the villages, and, <laughs> and people have to get them out. You know. But, but there's also the whole thing about snakes, which is what I find myself and other people have talked about. Is is their eyes? Mm -hmm. Even though it feels like they are watching you, but yet when you look at them, it feels like there's nothing there. <laughs> well, yeah, but what's interesting is it. You know, you in the, they say the most advanced snakes are the vipers, and particularly the pit vipers, which are the rattlesnakes, because they have um, a thing called this pit, which is a kind of pineal 
gland was also connected with the third eye, but it's a heat sensing. It's it's that fallen thing of that, and they can sense heat of an of a warm blooded creature, you know, which is almost like an occult power you know, across space, and uh, and also the vipers are more advanced because they have hypodermic fangs, which means that they fold them up and the poison flows through the inside. Whereas other snakes, like cobras, just a direct bite and they kind of saliva goes in. It's a whole... So it's interesting because in a way the rattlesnakes are mainly American. And you see that's the end of evolution. So in the Americas you have the most advanced serpents in some senses. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, they, they're not the biggest. You have the... No. You go back to... Well, you get in South America, you get the anaconda, but you get... Then you get in... A, in Asia, the reticulated python, which is the longest snake in the world, you know, and they're huge. Also, another thing about snakes is the patterns they have on them, which is also images of astral forces moving up and down the on the uh, spinal cord, you know, the con- caduceus. Oh, you know, right. those, those uh-huh. are the rhythms. They're rhythms on their body, which are, you know, which are put to the service of the higher music, you know. So, yeah, there's a lot in that whole thing about them. Because in a way they bear, they're the kind of Judas of the animal world, you know. They, you know, but they have to be redeemed. And when they are redeemed, they'll be very great servants of the earth, you know. Because obviously they're adaptable to every, you know. They can swim in the seas. They can yes, live on I mean, the they land. Are, they, are, they are very <laughs> yes. They are like the insects. They're very. They are found almost everywhere except in the extreme cold places. You know, they are they are quite limited by that, but. But they, in all other environments, they are, yeah, sea snakes. Interesting, sea snakes are the most poisonous, but they're also the most docile. They're much less likely to attack you, but their venom is very, very powerful. Oh. So, <coughs> yes. That's going to, I have to ask now about, you know, obviously there's the depiction in many places of the snake on the cross. Yeah. So maybe we could just talk about that a little bit, because many people ask me about that. They see it in churches, in church windows. Well, it's, like, it's almost like this idea that Lucifer, at the time of the crucifixion, said, I should should have been me. You know, I mean, mm. in a sense. And that, you know, there are ideas that Lucifer, at the time of the mystery of Golgotha, himself as a being, was almost redeemed. But there are many Luciferic beings who didn't follow that. They went onto Ariman's side, and that... That is the most potent and difficult thing to deal with when Luciferic beings work with Araman, because what you're letting, getting then is the Luc- they can create this beautiful mask. They can become the cosmeticians of Araman, his hairstylist, his you know all the things that give him his Botox. His, you know, makes him more and more acceptable. Those beings are alluring, very alluring. Mm. You know, whereas if you saw Araman as he really is, using the help get out of here quick <laughs> you know I mean that's that's what they do and that's what's very potent so you have Ariman's intelligence giving us all this brilliant sort of stuff from behind the scenes and the Lucifer is the star who comes on the stage and says it's really beautiful isn't it really? he's you know so and together it's a very powerful and you can imagine that would be you know a day when this manifest I call the day of manifestation when this great performance comes you know and all the spin doctors of Cosmos are there, you know, telling us how it's all about, what it's all about, and it's very alluring. And a lot of these, quite a few of these gurus, not all of them, some great true ones, but some use that luciferic power to simulate love, you know, this feeling of sort of, you know, I'm saying, I'm somebody, you're beautiful, I'm beautiful, you know, you know I mean, it's sort of, <coughs> so it's got to be aware of those four, and it's, it's discriminating what, you know, you look at a human being, what the, where they are, what they're doing, what they want, what... You can tell how much of Luciferic and Aramaic forces or Christ forces are working in human beings. You know, that's you can't judge them, but you can either help them, and, you know, if they want to open up. And of course, it's all it's still in us. It's still part. We're not all totally of the light. You know, we know that. That's what we're aiming towards, isn't it? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You, you know, either if you're aiming towards it, you're going to fall many times. But as long as you keep climbing. You know, that's the main thing. No one's perfect, but and you've got to be very, very careful when somebody says they are. You can tell they're not. You know, St. John said, those that say they are without sin, the truth is not in them. You know, 
to deceive themselves. You know, we're all of us, however advanced, developed we are, we're not that. We're not on that level. But we, you know, as long as we keep on that faith, you know, that's that's the main thing. Yes, we better seek the truth. <laughs> And the ancient wisdom or the ancient truth is always there, but it's uh, obviously, as you were saying about the use of these gurus and that they take it off on other lines and people easily fall for it. Oh, That's yeah. why I say to everyone, learn to, to um, decipher if it's true for your before, you know, be able to, if you can do these exercises that Steiner says, it helps you to develop yourself so you're aware if you're in front of falsity or deceit or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think... You know, in, in, even in these great works of fiction, things like, uh, well, Star Wars, I mean, that's, uh, or Lord of the Rings, you've got extraordinary images uh, of truths that can speak to you. I mean, the Jedi are really those human beings who reactivate the ancient wisdom, which, and that has to fight against the Death Star, which is Aramanic brilliance, you know. Um, and, in, and in Lord of the Rings, you've got this whole thing about, well, Sauron and Saruman. Saruman is the great Luciferic figure, you know, and Sauron is the Aramanic, you know, and that and Gandalf represents the potential of the human being. So, <laughs> and us humans are kind of grey, but he aspired to become the white, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, Which that that's, that's also very. This whole thing about the grey is interesting because that's almost like, you know, there is a pure the purification. The, the hair goes white in total purification of the astral body, you know, in a sense. And that, you know, there's some truth in that. And of course, that what happened with Gandalf. He fought against the Balrog, and that lifted him onto another whole level. You know, I mean, the thing about even I have to remember that if a human being attains the ascension body, it's not like a normal physical body or even a resurrection body. They cannot actually. You couldn't just get a resurrection body and just fit in with society and get a job in a bank or something. You, you know. He, you, you have to go, you eventually have to ascend and go on to another level. You're not, you know, it just doesn't work to stay on that level, with, though the purpose is for all of us to go up there. But, but you could then, through various sheath interaction, possibly incarnate in the future. But then you're taking up the physical, through stages you're taking up a new, but even that physical embodiment would be special, very different. Like, for instance, the Bodhisattva who's going to become the Maitreya Buddha. You know, that's going to be a very extraordinary process. But it's quite a difficult thing to explain all this though, isn't it? Because it's more of an experiential and you know, none of us have experienced it. We can only give ideas yeah, of what's coming. Yeah. yeah, well I mean that yeah, degrees of that. I mean I think that's there are many there are cases going on even now, like in the Bible, like the two witnesses, that's a conceivable possibility that a state will be reached, like a master, a sinned master, you know, but <clears throat> Remind people what the, who the two witnesses well, that, are and what that story is. They're spoken about in the book of eleven, uh, chapter eleven, book of Revelation, and it says, you know, I shall charge my two, I shall give power unto my two witnesses. I shall give them a measuring, measure not the uh, outside the temple, only the temple, you know. And they distinct about they will prophesy for one thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth, um, and they these have the power to shut heaven that it rain not in the day of their testimony. They have various powers, you know, to do things to the earth. And the warning is that no man must hurt them. If they do, they shall be killed by fire, you know. I mean, they're very powerful. Um, and then it talks about they, they, they are killed by the Antichrist, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit shall make war upon them and kill them. And then they, for three days they lie in the great city and people are celebrating their death, you know, the world. The materialistic world is celebrating their death. And on the third day, they're, they're resurrected. Now, in a way, you think, wow, that could actually happen. I mean, it's like, you know, it also says, and, you know, all over the world, their enemies shall behold them. And you think, hmm, you've got the internet. You've got all this stuff, you know, these things. This could be a meeting through the intense aromatic technology where the other side also makes itself visible for a moment, you know, so, and that, that could be, though, and that would be, their resurrecting would also be a foretaste of the possibility of all human beings. You know, they would be the, the first two after the incarnation, you know, so, and, you know, all these, and the Maitreya Buddha, I mean, it could be that the Maitreya Buddha 
these two beings prepare the incarnation of the Maitreya Buddha, you know, so through the larynx, possibly, you know, so it's, there's a lot which is, but I mean, yeah, there are many levels of grasping it, I mean, you can grasp it in your heart, you can know, yes, it's true, I can't understand it, but I, f I sense it's true, you know, that's really where we're at, mostly, you know, so. And I feel the same way, I sense that it's true, or yeah, what's, yeah. what this kind of work is, yeah. and um, and always known since as, as a child that the you know the material secular world that I was being brought into, there was something not quite right with yeah, it. Yeah. You know, and I know people say I'm very lucky to have had that from a young child. Mm. Which I've still not made myself <laughs> enlightened and turned myself into a Buddha. But, well, well, it takes time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it's been wonderful having a conversation with you, Patrick. But you also have still your conversations in <coughs> Rudolf Steiner House on yeah. Saturday mornings. Maybe you could explain about them a little bit and when the next one is for people that would like to come along. Um, yeah, the next one is not this Saturday, the one the next Saturday. So that's Saturday, the 22nd, Saturday, 22nd, 22nd, 22nd of June. Yeah. 22nd of June, 2024. Yeah. And it starts at 10, usually about 10.30. The whole idea is that you pay £10, you get a free coffee and a cake and possibly as many coffees as you want. Um, and then you, then we have, we sit around and we talk and discuss and share things for come at least two hours, maybe a bit longer, you know. So we've, you know, we've had some good sessions, really good sessions. Uh, occasionally it gets a bit heated. It did the last time we had a bit, of, but that's all right. But heated <laughs> in a in a way that it helped people develop themselves. I yeah. know sometimes things like this do get heated. I get myself lots of comments put onto my YouTube channel that could be a bit heated sometimes. Yeah, yeah, but, um, yeah. There are disagreements. There are things which I'm, I, you know, I, I, if, you know, I don't want to get, get into this again, but there are things that split the world at the moment. And we can see that archetypally in America, huge splits going on. And I think, you know, so my, I mean, I'm, I'm going to this Extinction Rebellion because I know somebody who's a friend who did big, this big uh, demonstration Saturday the 22nd, I think it is. Oh, same day as your conversation. Yes, I'm going to afterwards. Her, I'd still like go to it. I mean, I've known her for years. I used to, I lived with her for a while. She's a very intelligent, she's a great human being. But I, but you know, I was sitting in the cafe just now, and when we when we started that, and, you know, laid into say, hey, you don't believe in all that, do you? So, so I, I mean, I, I, you know, I didn't want to get into any anger. I didn't. I tried not to, but I, you know, I do. I, I have strong feelings about. It. I, I do respect the scientists. On that level, I don't respect the cosmologists in that. Mm. But I do respect the climate scientists. And I look at the evidence all over the world, things are going on, which have never happened. Now, you could say they're not... We, we only notice them because we've got the technology to see them now. They were happening before, but we never noticed no. them. But I think... You agree there is climate crisis. There, I think there's a change, and whether it's <coughs> the end times, yeah, as no, I, I like that. to think of I mean, it yeah, as, no. or yeah, climate crisis, yeah. but... Um, I follow a YouTube channel who puts up about earthquakes yeah, and volcanic yeah, yeah, yeah. activity and it has been spiking more yeah, and more yeah, and more yeah, definitely yeah, since yeah, 2012. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and that, to me there is no hidden agenda there. I think it's like, you know, the melting ice caps, the huge Antarctic and the Arctic ice now diminishing massively, the glaciers stopping, you know, and, and these all these fires all over the earth. Mm. You know. It's, to me, it's blatant. If you've got your eyes and senses open, you've, you've got to acknowledge it. And I respect these people, these scientists. I, mean, I do respect their, that kind of knowledge. That is valid. So I was a bit upset, I have to say, you know, with the reaction I got. Well, I think it's more a case of, for us, because I, I often used to go on Extinction Rebellion and marches myself. Yeah. I don't get involved in anything that's going to, you know, I don't glue myself to trains or anything. Yeah. But I think it's a good way of making other people that are unaware, aware yeah. of what's going on. And yeah. in their hearts, they want to look after the planet, which is what all the religions and faiths yeah, 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 are all yeah, about. We yeah. should be living with the planet in harmony, not raping it, yeah, not as if we control it and it's there yeah, for us yeah, to yeah, you know, yeah. get what we need. Yeah. We should be living with the animals, working yeah. with the plants and the, and the world itself. Yeah, yeah. And keeping our waters clean and our air Safe yeah, of course, degree. of course, it's, it's, it's somewhat in blatantly obvious. So I, I find it a bit much, and people sort of deny it, or you know, it, it's, 
Oh, I, well, I keep my cool. I just say, well, we haven't woken up to it, really. I, mean, I just think. Exactly. And then so sort of the question is, what can we do about it? I, well, I say, and you, you know, because it's all the big companies. Yes, it is, too. And those, those are the main challenge, those big forces that, you know, big financial powers and vested interests. Yes, but that doesn't mean to say that each individual hasn't got a responsibility as well. Exactly, yes, you know? yeah. You know, We're we still need to put our litter in the bins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it does make me laugh, though. That one of the Extinction Rebellion ones I went to, Afterwards, I saw loads of them queuing up in McDonald's, and I'm like, okay, yeah, that's a bit yeah. weird. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, that's it. I mean, I, I said to me, who I really like, I think she's great, but I said to her, look, we, you know, I, I just said to her, look, I've been a vegan since 1968. I have no central heating. I have virtually no running hot water. I've never owned a car. I've never owned a house. You know, I mean, and, you know, I've always, you know, done what I can. The things I'm not, the recycling is difficult actually in town hamlets. So, and I also, try, I give to charities, quite a lot of charities. So I felt, you know, I was trying to re-establish my moral high ground because I think she was thinking, ah, oh, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, this thing with Russia, oh, you know, you're not, you know, you're on the wrong side, you're a, you're a part of the big well, establishment. People do have different views, which yeah. is fine to have, um, but we shouldn't be judging people on what their views no, are. Well, well, yeah, we shouldn't totally. I mean, the point is, we can disagree with somebody, but you can still respect them. It, it, that is, generally mm. speaking, th I think in some areas now, there is such a huge polarisation that some people get convinced, and whatever you say to them, they're not going to change. You know what I mean? They're fixed. That's different. But even them, you still mustn't completely demonise them. you just got to say, well, and also, if you thought you're doing the right thing, you go and do it. If you felt it was not the right thing, you know, it's, a, it's a, still a difficult one to call because I know many people are going down too many uh, rabbit holes in the conspiracy field. But then, who do we trust? Who do we support? Yeah. Who do we, you know, and we've got to follow what our, our own hearts Yeah, want I agree to with do. you. I think, I, think, I think there are also there are insidious influences. I do think, you know, I mean, this whole thing about the BBC which I listen to, Radio 3, Radio 4, and Classic FM, I listen to them. And I think a lot of them, a lot of it is very good. I think of all the big media companies in the world, the BBC is one of the best. And it's got, people respect it, you know. I mean, and there, are, there is this woman, Lisa Doucette, who's, I've said it before, she's a foreign correspondent. She exposes herself to danger all the time. She's very compassionate human being. You just know this is a very authentic human being. I know, but also in all corporations there is corruption. And the science programs, a lot of them I don't agree with. I think, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of bit of rubbish. But there's also, and you're just dismissing them as, oh, that's the media, you know, that's the media. It's like saying, oh, well, they, it's only the media, it's not true. That is ridiculous. It's like also saying all politicians are liars. That's, that's also, you know, and I say to the human beings, are you, do you, are you always truthful? You know, I mean, mm. they're human beings as well. And I'm, to do that job, I wouldn't want to do it. It's bloody, some of it's hard. And, and there's some good people too, you know. And yeah, maybe they are forced into some kind, especially this time in an election. But, you know, it's, it's too easy to just to dismiss that stuff as, you know. I, I'm with you on that, because I try to, I don't like it when people, um, what do they say, is paint everybody with the same brush. Yeah, you yeah, can't, because yeah, yeah, yeah. everybody is different in whatever Absolutely. society, organisation, group. You're it's lazy, it's versions. very lazy thinking, you know, you've got to really, there's nuance in every area, every, especially in the world of politics and those sort of things, there's always two valid sides, and I, I yeah, what I fall down, I, I think the, for me the absolutes are a situation where people are being killed, that's wrong, when you're doing that, that's wrong, yep. well, whatever side you're on, that's, you're not doing a good thing there, you know. But then there are all kinds of things, the back stories, why are they doing it, why are they doing it, yes, okay, you might, well, but still, that's not an answer, that's not an answer, that's not going to help, you know, so, you know, but it's different, I'm learning how to, to know the dangers, oh, I mustn't say that in this situation. <laughs> when someone's so, pushing your buttons, you yeah, must be aware that yeah, they're pushing yeah, your yeah, buttons. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Of course, they, but they're not often aware that they're doing it, you've got to be exactly. aware that they're doing yes. it. Exactly, yes. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. It's been a wonderful chat as always, mm. and uh, lots of snake talk and serpent <laughs> talking. That's so. Um, yeah, but yeah. the snakes could be good or bad. We must not 
painting. They're all part of history. That's it, yes. And that's the most They're important. in all mythologies. Yeah. So yeah. thank you very much. So you've got the conversation on the 22nd of June at Steiner House in the cafe, 10.30, yeah. is it? Yeah. I've also got a story I'm reading on the Friday. To 21st of June. Yeah. And that's Friday night at 7 p.m. Yeah. at Steiner House, yeah. London. Yeah. And that should, to some, some extent, answer some of the puzzles that man is trying to sort out. <laughs> and maybe puzzles of those that are listening. So thank you very yeah. much yeah. and thank you everybody for listening. Yeah. Until next time. Peace. Great. Bye. <laughs>